You might be an architect who uses Grasshopper and Rhino for your designs, or you might be a designer who uses Blender and is curious what else is out there. Clearly one is open source, which is being Blender, but the other one is used a lot more within architecture design already. So in this video, let's jump in and do attractor-based tessellations. And in the end, I will compare the result between what we have in Blender to what we have in Rhino. So how does this work? We have a little component here, and this component is arrayed onto a grid. And then we pick the top face of each component and we extrude it to offset it because there is no clear way to offset in Blender yet. And then the whole thing is attracted to this mesh here, which can change in size or shape and so on. And the good thing about all of this in Blender is that it's quite performative. If we push this out quite a bit, 140, you can see that it's pretty much in real time here. Now, if we compare the same thing in Rhino and we try to increase the grid, so let's see what are the numbers that we have, 140. The grid is the same, by the way. So let's type in 140 and plug that into our grid. Still thinking. Meanwhile, Blender, we can play around and how about we change the fall off a little bit more. Rhino is still thinking, so you get the point. Let's get started with building this from scratch. And as always, the file and an in-depth guide is available on Patreon. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a plane. Like I start pretty much every project. I'm going to make that plane 750 millimeters rectangle. And this is going to be our paver. We want to apply the scale in object space. So press Control A and then scale to apply it. Now go into edit mode by pressing tab, I to inset, and let's type in 0 0.005, something really small. And then let's extrude this up, 0 0.005. Again, something really small and faint. This is more to delineate our geometry. Next, we want to assign a few materials. So we want a side material that this is going to be everything on the side. Then we want a separate material for the top face. So let's click on this material here. And we'll have another material, which is inner material. This won't be assigned to anything and it will be part of our geometry node setup. So that's our component. Let's hide this and now let's create a cube. I'm going to center it by pressing Alt G. In geometry nodes, create new. Let's get rid of this. Bring in our plane, put in the geometry to make sure that we see it. And it's there, woohoo. Now let's create a grid and we're going to instance onto the grid. The grid in Blender works with the total size of X and Y. I prefer to work with cell sizes. To do that, let's create a few values and value. Shift D to duplicate this. Let's add integers, Shift D, and rename these. So press F2 and we'll say X cell. This will be our Y cell size. This will be X count and this will be Y count. Now let's add a multiply to put these two together. So that's within a math node and then select multiply. We plug this into here, shift D to duplicate, and now the Y size with the Y count goes into here. And then we need to add an extra vertex count to our actual count because we have the count of faces, but the vertices are always one more. Let's do something uh, that's quite even and small so you can see what I mean. Right now we have 45 because we haven't plugged this in. And you see, even though we say count, this is because it's the number of vertices, not the number of faces. So the easiest thing to do is add an add node to each one of these vertices. And now we have faces that are exactly the cell size. And that's the number of faces. Now, what I usually do is create a group with all of this and also a more advanced bit where we move this over. So I will delete that part and I will add my group, which is called grid. And if we plug that into here, you see it's pretty much the same as what you saw. And there is an extra bit which changes the origin because by default, the grid's origin is at the center. And if I go inside of here, I've just done some vector multiplication to transform this grid. So it sits in the corner and then there's a switch node which can be toggled within the group size. Cool, grid's out of the way. Now, we know that our plane is 0.75 by 0.75. So we can plug that into there and now we can instance some points. So for each grid point, 
we will have one of our pavements. And instead of working with a cell size in case our base geometry changes or we scale it up, we can use the bounding properties. If we add a boundary box, search for vector math, subtract. And what we're doing by subtracting the minimum from the maximum is getting the dimensions of the bounding box. And we want to separate the x, y, z coordinates. And then all we need to do is plug in the x in here and the y in here. And in this case, because it's the same size, it always works. But let's go, for example, for our component. And if we scale it, we have to be in edit mode. And if we scale it, you see that everything adjusts itself, which is exactly what we want. So back in our cube, let's rename this grid. So now what are we gonna do? We're gonna extrude those top faces and then we'll scale them down based on our attractor. First, let's add an extrude mesh node. And we don't want to extrude everything. We want to only extrude the top face. And the easiest way to select it is with material. And we did name that top. So now it is only extruding those top faces. And we don't actually want to extrude them. So we can put that back to zero. What we want to do is scale. So search for scale elements, plug this into here. And for the selection, we only want to scale the top face. And now we're scaling up and down. Next, let's assign a material. So search for set material, plug this into here. And we want to say inner, but we want that material to be only for the specific section, which are these top faces. They're not really top faces, but that's what they come out to conveniently as a selection from the extrude mesh node. So if you plug that into there, you see now we have all of these scaling. Now we don't want them to be uniform. So let's add our tractor plane. I'm just going to display it as a wire so it doesn't get in the way. Let's grab that plane into here. We want to make sure we're using relative instead of original coordinates in this case. Next, search for proximity, geometry proximity. Plug this into here. And now we, we're going to use this distance to scale our elements. So we can plug this into scale. And it kind of works, but it's too large. So now let's add a map range node and that allows us to change the minimum and the maximum distances. If we go further away, it scales. But right now you see they all scale the same and the reason is that all of these are still instances. We can hover over here and it says we have 40 instances. So we need to realize the instances to make them back into geometry. So if we plug that into here, you see that now this works. And we can play with the map range to see what works well or we can even reverse it by changing minimum to be one and maximum zero. So now the effect is reversed. So let's go ahead and make this a little bigger in both directions. And if we move it, it follows. And the nice thing, again, because this is in geometry nodes, it's, it's quite performant, right? So we can have a pretty massive grid, edit the shape or extrude or duplicate, or even create a new shape. Let's create a duplicate of a face and adjust the parameters. And it works really well, quite fast. Let's bump this up to 500. Let's slow down a little bit. Still working pretty well. And it's a lot of geometry. You see, we have 4 million vertices. This is actually one of those instances where the node tree is more straightforward than it would be in Grasshopper. So for the sake of a proper comparison, let's see how it looks in Grasshopper. In Grasshopper, you can do this in a number of different ways. In fact, you would rarely start with a component initially. You would sort of want to build them and have the variation throughout. But because I wanted to keep this as comparable as possible to geometry nodes, I am doing it in a very similar way. So the component is the same, and then we create a grid, which is over here. So this is the grid node, and then we place the component onto the grid. So each point gets one of the planes. And this is one of the advantages of doing things in grasshoppers. We have a lot of better edit capabilities, right? So I deconstructed each face and drew out the vertices that form the top faces, create a polyline and create an offset. And that offset, the distance of the offset, is once again guided by an attractor, which in this case is this curve. And what we're doing is measuring the point from each grid point, which is coming in from here, to this curve. And then we're remapping that, just like we did in geometry nodes, from specific distance to another kind of distance. One of the advantages is that we do have offset, right? So this works much better if we're not dealing with squares. Squares and regular polygons work fairly well with just scaling, but offset is a little bit better. Although it could also be a little bit slower. And in fact, we don't need to join things and that's what's slowing this down quite a bit. Instead, let's add a merge node. So if we move it, it should adjust. It's not as instantaneous as we get in Blender, but that's not the point of Rhino and Grasshopper. 
As always, the files are available on Patreon. Thanks very much for watching, guys, and let me know what you think about this tutorial, and see you next time.